Hello and welcome to episode 26 of Inherited Will, a One Piece podcast. A weekly podcast discussing each week's manga chapter and a reread of past chapters. My name is Thomas. And I'm Jordan. I will be going right on in the chapter 1023, a lot to talk about this week, no doubt, and then later chapters 287 to 303. Here we go. Ten twenty three spitting image. We've got plenty of birds here on the front page. You know, some nice flowers. Crew down there, real grumpy. I don't blame them. Phoebe giving attention to other birds would make me mad too. Poor guy. <laughs> yeah, he's got it real rough. Phoebe seems fine. She's having the time of her life. <laughs> Indeed. Sorry, Crew. You have been replaced. Um, that lets us pop right on in to the main chapter, picking up right where we left off, right after Sanji and Zoro have given our boys, King and Queen, a right boppin', knock them on their respective butts. Feels good. Yeah, not for them, but, you know. Well, we find out later that they're totally fine and literally didn't feel it, but... That's true. <laughs> but, I mean, it must be embarrassing to be on your back, at least. As far as uh, Katakuri's opinion is concerned, that's correct. Mm-hmm. How embarrassing for these two. Chopper here seems surprised that it actually did heal Zoro. I'd be pretty shocked as well if I were a man of medicine that this miracle potion actually exists. Miyagi down there reiterates that there are going to be problems later, so let's keep that in mind moving forward, I guess. I had no trouble remembering it, but thanks, Miyagi. Indeed. Somebody up there, some random gifter or something, take an aim at Zoro, just sliced up by Kawamatsu, a lad I forgot existed. There he is. He hasn't done much, and apparently the rule is continue to not do much. <laughs> Indeed. Haven't seen Kawamatsu nor Izo ever since Sanji split up from them when he burst into the scene to give Queen that like rotisserie kick like a bazillion chapters ago, it feels like. And I guess they've just been kind of fighting randos since then. And they will continue to do so by order of Hyogoro here. Gotta keep the grounds clear. Pretty much. We check in with Marco again for a hot second, reminiscing about something that Whitebeard told him once. Apparently, before Mary Joie was atop of the red line, there existed a land of gods up there. Sounds neat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> certainly does. I'm sure it was better than having the Celestial Dragons up there. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> it's very strange, Jordan, because I did, as you may recall, I did my reread stuff yesterday, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it just seems more and more frequently recently, the events of the current chapter seem to have lined up pretty well with the events of the reread. You know, yeah, I I couldn't agree more. It's very weird, but uh, it's one of those happy accidents. Kind of getting my head of myself a tiny bit here, but it does pertain to this whole, like, Lunarian slash Land of Gods thing that we're talking about right now. But in the flashback in this chunk of chapters with Noland and all that, mm-hmm. uh, I'm looking at it, I'm like, hold on a second. These... The Shandians already either had wings or wore wing accessories prior to being blasted into the sky. Isn't that weird? So I did some digging into that. And apparently, and this is according to the wiki, I didn't like verify page by page each of the uh, Enaru cover page stuff. I trust the wiki. (laughs) I do to a certain extent, but in either case. According to them, according to Enaru's cover chapters... Both, or rather all three, Skypea, Burka, and Shandia, the people who live there, all descend from the original kingdom of Burka, which is the kingdom on the moon. What? Indeed. Apparently they ran, or were starting to run out of moon resources, and they migrated down and kind of split into three groups, one of which became the modern-day Skypeans, one of which became the Burkins, where... Enaru and Co were from, and one went all the way down to Jaya and became the Shandians. 
Okay. And now we're learning of a, another race of people called the Lunarians, which appear to have originated from a place atop the red line called God's Land. Mm-hmm. That doesn't seem like it's a coincidence, does it? <laughs> it can't be. And these people also have wings? Yeah. Are you saying that this is a potential fourth break off of the original? Or are you saying, like... I don't know, maybe the the giants split further or something like that. Um, my initial thought was that this was a fourth break off of the original, but I don't see any reason why it couldn't just be like... A subsection. Yeah, just yeah. an additional group of them. Um, there's no evidence to indicate either way. We would need more of a timeline, I think. Indeed. Uh, Which we don't currently have. All we have right now is a name of the race and the name of the place they hail from. So uh, not a whole lot to go off just yet, but that's what I'm sticking to for the moment. The puzzles, it's coming together. Indeed. And people say Skype here doesn't have any meaning. Yeah, for real. Foolish fools. (laughs) But uh, that's all I got on that for the moment. I'm sure we'll find out more in the coming chapters. I'm sure Marco's got more intel stewing in that pineapple head of his and he's got a fun way to disperse the info (laughs) indeed internally (laughs) someone takes a shot or something at marco fortunately izo is there to catch him give him a quick chastising about how he sucks and that he needs to pay attention while tumbling it's (laughs) it's pretty impressive indeed classic marco this is clearly not the first time they've had such an interaction (laughs) good point yeah (laughs) then we check back in with king and queen talking shit apparently they didn't even feel it he reiterates what their epithets are and how cool they are compared to them fire some lasers gotta intimidate indeed and uh almost immediately this is not the first page of the chapter but it's pretty early on This is kind of where a fresh sticking point uh, for me starts to rise. This bit with Sanji and co. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that my forthcoming whining is based entirely on assumptions made with information we're about to get. So there's a good chance it'll all be meaningless, but let me walk you through it all the same. Please. Here, Sanji says that his body has been feeling weird ever since he put the raid suit on the second time around. Uh, Queen also mentions in this little chunk, um, he brings up the possibility that Sanji's fire powers are a result of Judge's augmentations, and then also says, you're not a Lunarian. It is my concern that Queen's suspicions are correct, and kind of separately from that, using the raid suit has somehow starting to unlock his dormant Vinsmoke abilities... Uh, maybe somehow using Vinsmoke tech, like, taps into the inherent Vinsmoke tech kind of built into his genes, something along those lines. And that perhaps through the course of this battle, his fire powers will grow stronger, maybe his skin will become more durable. All the same stuff that the other Vinsmokes can do that Sanji currently can't. And I, personally, am not especially fond of that premise. <laughs> I've always been pretty attached to the original explanation that Sanji's fire powers exist because his heart just burns so dang hot, uh, as Sanji even notes in this chapter as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a classic Oda, very funny thing to do and say, and I have never really had a desire for any further explanation for this ability beyond that because we've already had it explained to us, right? In fairness, it does feel as though this retcon has been brewing for a long time, uh, ever since Whole Cake Island and we were introduced to Sanji's siblings, all of whom have like a weird elemental power of sorts. So again, I can't say I didn't see it coming. Right. But I prefer the idea that Sanji's main strengths come from his own hard work, training with Zephs, and not inherent bloodline powers given to him by a blood family that he doesn't even like. To me, it just depends on how it's done. Mm. I was talking to Bella earlier, uh, that's my wife for viewers listening at home. And she brought up a possibility that, yes, Sanji's fire powers could be because of his Vinsmoke augmentations. Maybe. But perhaps he is still 
defective in the sense that his power is either only come out when his heart is ablaze, as Oda originally explained it, or maybe they grow stronger as a result of his emotions. And I kind of like the second of those two options better, because in that scenario, his power is kind of a mix of gifts he received from Judge through his like tampering with him, Sora as well through like giving him emotions that increase his power, and of course Zeph by giving him his fighting style. The emotions that his mother sacrificed herself to give him make him stronger than the emotionless drones that Judge's ambitions by themselves created. Yeah, I would like that. That turns out to be true. Yeah, I like that. And there's nothing to indicate that's not the case just yet. But uh, I think it might be giving myself, or rather Bella in this case, and Oda perhaps too much credit to think that it'll turn out exactly as we want it to. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we can we can dream for a bit. And like you said, this isn't something that's just coming out of nowhere. Like, right. Oda has been thinking and planning this for quite some time. And, like, this is this is his baby, you know? He's got to take care of it, and he's got to do it well so i will i will hold on to hope you and me as well now down to the specifics of how it like kind of works in execution like this queen's lunarian comment here Mm -hmm. it could just be that he's just like oh the only species that i know of are the lunarians that can create fire like this but what if that is kind of hinting towards how the bloodline element of the Vince Motes actually works. See, yeah, that's kind of what I was going to bring up, because what if he is, you know, part Lunarian, actually? Like, what if he took Lunarian DNA, mixed it with him, and there are other species that he did that with his other children? Right, like maybe Niji's lightning powers are a result of a judge mixing him with a mink. They've got... Zappy powers. Yeah. I'm not quite sure how Yonji's, like, extendo arm uh, <laughs> would work. Maybe that's just, like, purely tech-based and Ichiji's light powers kind of in the same way, in the same way that uh, the pacifistas are made with lasers. Mm, okay. And Reiju could just be mixed with, like, anything poisonous. Right. Probably. I kind of like that idea. Could just be a throwaway line that Oda just wanted to name drop Kane's race for a hot second and it's not really connected with the Vince Mouse at all but uh I kind of hope that it is it Need is bolded right like he drew extra attention to it so he sure he did w- he wants you to pay attention and we are give us some more Oda please and then Kane's got this little like dot 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 thing going on yeah <laughs> all very suspicious yeah before we move on from the Sanji thing real quick, I do want to point out one thing that I do just by default like out of this exchange. It's always been a little weird to me that Sanji like increases his attack potency by lighting his foot on fire, because just having fire on your feet doesn't seem like it should be all that impressive when your characters you're fighting against are like durable as anything, you know? Sure. But Sanji does note here that his flame surpasses the temperature of flame because of his passion. So uh, that feels good. I like to have that confirmed, I guess. <laughs> this is no ordinary fire, basically. Right, yeah, in more ways than one. Indeed. He throws some spirally kicks, and the clash with Queen has begun properly. Feels good. Do you think we're going to see the raid suit? Or do you think Sanji's scared to use it because of the weird body feeling? I got a feeling that they're going to clash like this for a little bit. Queen is going to push him because, again, it sounds like he hasn't even really been taking damage from it so far. Then Sanji will put on the raid suit for a third time, and that will be like what like makes a click and mm-hmm. his uh, inherent Vinsmoke abilities finally emerge. And then he powers up, takes out Queen... Bing, bang, boom. Correct. Maybe not as simply as all that, but <laughs> no, nope, it's going to be like I said. Those sound effects: bing, bang, boom. <laughs> Watch for it, people. You heard it here first. Uh, then we check in with Zoro for a hot second. He's clashing with King, who has a weird like sword breaker type thing where he catches Zoro's swords in it, disarms him, and punches him in the face with a spiky glove. Zoro does manage to block it, though, so that feels good. Good for you, Zoro. 
he is using that mouth sword proud of him but <laughs> the line i see a killer machine huh i don't i don't know if i like that one zoro maybe <laughs> maybe send that one back to the workshop for a bit well, he did just get his sword stolen from him and had to block a last second, probably really fast punch with a sword that he's probably not used to using in this way. So you're saying give him a break? Yeah, and he also just like almost died fighting Kaido like 20 minutes ago. Let's let's cut the That's man some true. slack. We don't we don't know the side effects of this drug. Maybe it just makes him worse at banter. That's true. And uh, he does have a sword in his mouth right now, so I think anything coming out of it, aside from sword, is impressive in its own right. He has a sword in his mouth, like, 70% of the time. And it's very impressive that he can speak with that stuff in his <laughs> mouth, regardless. Absolutely. King appears to be just kind of like a do-whatever-it-takes-to-win trickery and weird weapons, all sorts of fun stuff type fighter. Not a straight swordsman, as we suspected he might be, or I did at least, can't speak for you. But he did have a sword, so yeah. I think that was a fair assumption. Yeah, and well, we've been suspecting the matchup with Zoro for a long time, and he always ends up with blades of some sort against him. Indeed. Think he'll actually end up beating this guy by tearing his throat out with his teeth? That would be awesome. <laughs> Indeed. I don't think One Piece is going to get that graphic, uh, <laughs> but... He's really putting it all on the line here, and he knows he's limited on time. So, Indeed. like, make it happen, man. Quite so. The island's already moving. It's pretty much at its destination already. And we don't know how long this, like, hyper-healing drug is going to last. Could be mm -hmm. one minute. Could be an hour. No idea. Could have used some more details on that, Miyagi, but got to work with what we got, I guess. Yeah, and, you know, I'm doubting this drug has been used much, so... There True. probably isn't a lot of data on it in the first place. Quite so. Then we learn a a little bit, just a, a tiny sliver of information about Zoro's lineage, apparently. Yeah, just a just a taste, huh? <laughs> yeah, they just kinda sneak that in here. <laughs> According to Hyodoro. Zoro is the spitting image, and I can see it with my own eyeballs, it seems to be true, of the Daimyo of Ringo, Shimotsuki Ushimaru, the lad who owned that fox guy um, from way back when. And according to Kawamatsu, even his sword style is the same. That part's weird, <laughs> right? <laughs> Agreed. I don't think that part's quite as weird as the one-eyed bit that he brings up. Yeah. Like, I feel like, yeah, them looking the same, totally pertinent information. It is weird that their sword style is the same, but, like, sure, maybe it's another bloodline thing. We don't necessarily know. Mm. But, like, that would... I, mm. I think the bit with his sword style being the same is like, oh, this is just more proof that they're probably connected in some way. Like, the main thing here is that they look, like, gosh darn identical. But Zoro, like, chose his own sword style he didn't learn it from someone else like uh correct the basic premise behind the three sword style is that he was getting bopped by kuina real hardcore with one sword and then two swords so three has got to be the way to go and i guess just by coincidence ushimaru here <laughs> had a similar experience in his youth i don't know yeah i'm sure we'll learn more but for now this feels weird <laughs> Agreed. Uh, and then on top of that, because Ushimaru was a descendant of Ryuma, that also makes it more than likely that Zoro is also a descendant of Ryuma, who apparently only had one eye. Cool, right. I guess. <laughs> yeah, like, it's a nothing. I'm sure many people only had one eye back then. I'm sure many people now only have one eye. Correct. I'm sure to some people this will feel... Kind of retconny. I don't really feel the same way because Zoro's lineage has never really been hinted at previously, but I'm sure a lot of people, myself included, probably assumed he had some sort of biological connection to someone in Wano. We've talked about it before, yeah. Like, we had to get something. Right. <laughs> Being directly related to Ryuma is a bit of a surprise, but uh, not one that I can't swallow. Fair enough. Sure. 
As for whether this is a retcon or not, I don't know how you could call it a retcon when there's nothing before. Like, yeah, this is just much. straight up establishing something. Indeed. Well, not exactly establishing, but you yes. know what I mean. They don't directly say, yes, he is this person's son or grandson or whatever, but... But he is. He looks literally identical. <laughs> so, yeah. the only weird thing is that if they are as identical as we're led to believe here, it's a little weird that when he fought the fox, there wasn't, like, some sort of indication made at that time. Yeah. That the fox, like, hesitating to fight someone who looks exactly like his master. Unless there was, and I just forgot, but... I don't recall anything like that back in those days. I got nothing. Yeah. Uh, then we pop in with uh, Inu Arashi and Jack. There they are. <laughs> Jack looking real big, real scary. Indeed. Except for his arms, which are real small by comparison <laughs> with the rest of him. <laughs> yeah, but it's holding a, a sickle blade, so that, that helps even it out, right? I suppose so. As far as hybrid forms go, I think Jax is probably the silliest we've seen, right? <laughs> um, yes, for sure. Look how big his head and legs are, and then his... I mean, I'm sure they're still massive, because his body as a whole is quite large, but mm -hmm. his little noodle arms, by comparison. <laughs> they just don't look... Like, his trunk is... Well, his horns are almost bigger. Yeah. It's... A sad look for this man. Indeed. <laughs> That's why he's the bottom of the three. Yeah, pretty much. What a uh, joke Jack is, as it turns out. Well, he Poor guy. always kind of has been. Like, Jack has been proven to be pr pretty low of intelligence, in in my opinion. So, When he first showed up on Zoe, I was intimidated by him then, because he had... By far the biggest bounty we had ever seen. He was so ruthless. He didn't care what anybody said. He was going to kill everybody there until he got Rizo, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then the only thing that could, like, take him down for good was the biggest elephant that's ever existed. Uh, but ever since he's come back into the story after that, he's been a bit of a punk. Yeah. Didn't he also, like, f fight an admiral or a couple of vice admirals or something by himself uh tried to he went after a do flamingo's prison ship which had sengoku and fujitora on it yeah like what was he expecting uh results that he did not get <laughs> I, I can't even imagine he would get anyway it just i'm somewhat impressed that he got away <laughs> But it was not wise of him to attempt in the first place. Yeah, he probably just, like, jumped in the water and waited to be saved again. I mean, fair enough. No one can get him there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, he is fighting Inu Arashi now. He throws a trunk punch, I guess. Trunk <laughs> smack. Slap? Yeah. <laughs> trunk attack. There you go. Uh, it's caught by Inu Arashi, though. Throws him out the window into, like, a little courtyard-ish area. Fortunately for him, because of Ashura Doji blowing up a few chapters ago, there's a big hole in the roof, and uh, the moon could be seen through it. So he's a Sulon boy once more. So is that, good. is that Ashura's body on the ground? Uh, yes, I think that is him there below uh, Jack. Jack and... Uh, you know, Rashi as they crash into it. Yeah. Okay. Just just making sure that that's what I'm seeing here. This room is starting to look a little bit corpsey, but before long, I'm sure we will have plenty of corpses to go around. Yeah, no doubt. The <laughs> Sulong form is going to add at least one, right? Correct. I mean, if Inu Arashi in base form was already kind of going toe to toe with hybrid form Jack, it does seem like he was getting pushed. Um, I think Su Long will be able to finish him off. Agreed. But you gotta watch out. He's still got that bandage on his nose, so he's not <laughs> at 100%. That's true. And he does have another bandage over his eye, so he's only working with 50% visibility. So, <laughs> poor guy. Over his eyes? What? Uh, over one of his eyes. In Su Long form? Oh, no, I'm talking about Jack. Oh, Jack. Yeah, no, I was... I was talking about Inu Arashi. 
I see that now. But Jack does also have a bandage on his trunk. So <laughs> he does. Yeah. Okay. I just like the little bandage on Su Long, man. But uh, they're both keeping it keeping it uh, clean out there. <laughs> Good for them. Then we pop back outside where Necromamushi has recently cat punched Paro Sparrow. Apparently, this is like literally exactly where Carrot and Wanda went down. They're outside, so he also goes Su Long, and they're they're gonna fight. <laughs> I don't think this. Well, <laughs> I, it depends on if the other two join back in, but I don't expect this to be a terribly long fight. Uh, me neither. It does kind of seem like Jack is stronger than Paro Sparrow based on what we've seen. Yeah. Um, and these two are supposed to be equal, so. Indeed. Uh, so we'll see what happens there, I guess. In theory, Nekomamushi is also kind of fresher than Inuarashi, because he hasn't been tussling with Parasparo already, as opposed to Jack's fight, which has been going on for a little while, at least. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. I don't think Parasparo's coming out scot-free. Poor guy. Then we check in with one final fight before... Wrapping up with a big reveal at the end. Say what you will about the Frankie versus Sasaki fight. This is now confirmed, non-subjective. This is just straight facts I'm about to give you. Triceracopter, literal garbage. Earlobe copter. <laughs> That's the cool shit. <laughs> it doesn't even need a name. It's so cool. That's right. Rizo and earlobe guy are fighting more the only thing of note here is that Rizo's like i know he's small but we'll watch him as he grows up and wano will grow up with him nope no none of those things turn the page and bam boom he's already a grown dragon of a ripe 28 years old in terms of body <laughs> yep 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 there's a lot going on here for how little we are shown <laughs> indeed Interesting that he does look literally identical to Kaido. Certainly not as large as Kaido, but the same. Like, I feel like there should be some differences. Well, presumably he's pink as opposed to blue. Oh, good point. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's some. Uh, Luffy, though, recognizes him, likely because he is pink, and he has seen Momo in his tiny baby form before and knows what Kaido looks like having fought him mere minutes prior. Then over on the left here, we get a little bit of information about what he looks like when he's a a man. Presumably he looks just like Odin. She doesn't say it, but I can't think of anyone else that she would be talking about. <laughs> so that's what I'm going with. But Momonosuke and Luffy vow to take back Wano together. End of chapter. To be continued. Point, so. As is the norm. <laughs> pretty much. As a whole, I think this chapter was pretty good. I don't have much to complain about aside from that potential Sanji thing <laughs> pretty early on. And again, that's just based off my assumptions of how Oda's going to handle it. But it certainly was jam-packed with info. Now, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm a little... Well, I'm a little worried that, like things are going to wrap up almost too quickly for me at this rate. But if he keeps putting in as much like actual information as he did this chapter, then I guess that would actually, that would work. Uh, I guess so. I mean, I'm reasonably convinced that we're not going to see Luffy and Momonosuke again for a few more chapters. Um, probably not until we wrap up the rest of those fights, all of which I think we saw in this, aside from Apu and Drake, I think we like touched on all of the remaining fights this chapter. Uh, um, technically, there is Kaido and Yamato. Oh, that's also true. I would guess that we also won't see that outcome until uh, Momo and Luffy arrive up there. Yeah, I would love to see just a snippet of that, though. Indeed. It was teased, and then we've had nothing. Correct. We've just seen, like, two small snippets of it at the end of a couple chapters, which is not enough for me, but 
I'm sure it'll be fleshed out one day. Yeah, I think that's all I have to say on 1023. Pretty good stuff. Indeed. That takes us into the reread, covering the rest of Skypea 287 through 303. Take it away. I will do that. So we go into this flashback with Admiral Noland, who gives us a little bit of info on his background, how he's done some exploring. Uh, and then, well, later we find out that it's actually extensive exploration that he's done. But he's out and about, and he hears a bell, and he's like, whoa, that's neat. I should go I should go find where that is. This man must be related to Smoker in some way with ears that good. <laughs> that's confirmed right now. But they make their way there due to, you know, the the basically the island actually reaching out to them and guiding them there. And then things get kind of wonky. They sure do. The first thing this man does is kill these people's god. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he sure does. Sacrifices, no good, according to Nolan. I get it. It's bad, but that, I don't, oof. It's dangerous territory, man. But apparently he does this all the time. <laughs> Notable God Slayer Nolan. Badass title. Not very, uh, culturally sensitive, this man. Yeah, but... exactly. <laughs> but, you know, they were literally about to kill this lady for no reason basically yes because we find yes. out that the guy like in this context that it was just a snake yeah for sure he ends up being right on all accounts which is great but his introduction is just like whoa okay <laughs> quite so so yeah he just uh creates a few issues there but he's got confidence and uh apparently a lot of staying power because he is stabbed through the chest and then just totally fine after that and shortly thereafter, he spends like a day and a half crushed between two sizable chunks of land and is fine after some bandages. Yep. Tanky man, this Nolan. Terrifying to imagine. Well deserved of the Tantata's respect. <laughs> yeah, and mine. But like this flashback is just, it's really long and I feel like it just introduces a lot of conflict that could have been avoided with better communication like the the two big issues that i saw between these two groups were the tree fever which if nolan would have just been like from from the get-go like i can do this it's i'm gonna have to go get a plant and then it'll be you'll be fine and then they were like hey there's these special plants don't touch them <laughs> And then he was like, oh, hey, I saw those. They're actually the source of the problem. It all would have been fine. But instead, this man just tries to needlessly help. And again, yes, it does end up all being okay. It's all great. But man, does he make a lot of jumps. <laughs> just no second guessing himself or anything like that. No checking in with people. Just... I know what's best, and I'm going to do it, whether that's cool with you or not. Yeah, that's definitely a flaw Nolan has. Uh, he's a bit of a know-it-all. He assumes he knows best, and again, in this case, he, he's technically correct, I guess. Yeah, like, he helps a lot of people, for sure. But, <laughs> like, if... Ugh, he could have done it better. <laughs> that's all. These were his friends, and he still, like, didn't bring them in on the process? That just feels weird. True. Chandians are clearly very intelligent people. Um, but maybe he assumed they, like, wouldn't really understand, like, the ins and outs of the scientific process that he would have to describe to them. An incorrect assumption, because that one doctor guy explains it to him just fine, and they forgive him. Yeah, one explanation, and they're good. They yeah. also could have just, like, taken one of the shandians as like a guide and that would have been fine like they would have it would have been okay true yeah but 
like Shame again, on you, Nolan. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a story, and we need conflict for it to be interesting. But like, it was a long flashback that just kind of felt like it was reiterating a few things, like over and over. I also felt kind of the same way later in this chunk, but I'll get to that. Nolan goes back, tells the king about El Dorado, the worst king in the world, by the way. And he's just like, great, cool, take me, I want that gold. And when they go back, uh, it's gone. And the man is sentenced to death for being dishonest. Which at first I was like, that feels extreme. But then I thought about it, and that definitely happened in real life. So, sure. that's allowed here. <laughs> and in this particular case, this supposed lie did mean that he dragged the king and his soldiers into the most dangerous place in the planet, the Grand Line. I, I know what you're saying, but they actually forced themselves there. Like, he even commented that the main problem was that the crew was hastily trained. True, yes. So, like, they but... they chose that fate, and again, it's a shitty king who's gonna make sure he comes out on top no matter what. Like, Certainly. Not to defend that particular king, but he did only go there trusting the word of Noland. For sure, for sure, with the worst of intentions, but yeah. <laughs> Indeed. That's the main takeaway here. Uh, that cane sucks. Noland didn't lie. The dude, yeah, he was awful. And Oda made sure we knew it just from looking at him, so good job. And they, like, fabricated evidence during that trial, too. Just... <laughs> yeah, which is really weird. And then, like, they didn't even think to round up the rest of the actual crew. Indeed. Ding-dongs all around. Mm-mm-mm. Young folk these days, 400 yeah. years ago. Uh, so we also get in this flashback the arrival of the big chunk of land that went up there. Uh, and we see the kami of the time basically inciting this 400-year war just by being greedy. But the dude looked kind of like uh, the head of the Heavenly Warriors person. He does. He looks a lot like Yama. Yama, thank you. That could be something, but could also just be coincidence. But yeah, he just immediately was the greediest man that was just so entitled, had to have it, and people paid for it forever. So, fuck that guy. <laughs> Indeed. Cause a lot of trouble. Shitty people are going to be shitty. What are you going to do? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. that dude's already dead, so like cool got what he deserved i suppose we got a lot of information it was fairly drawn out i can see how like following that on a weekly basis might have felt bad but reading through it all now is fine it's good then we get back to the present and we get a little bit of a reminder on you know just how bad things are before luffy re- reiterates his main desire to just ring the bell uh make sure that Mont Blanc cricket knows that he, he hasn't been well he has kind of been searching in vain but his ancestors are good to go <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't been searching in vain he's just been looking in the wrong place so that's all yeah it well it still probably doesn't feel great but uh mission accomplished regardless indeed I guess by searching, he did find Luffy, who then found the actual place, so he caused it. Good job. Indeed. Works out pretty well for Cricket in the end. No doubt. So, <laughs> this is this is what I alluded to earlier with just the, the problem of repetition here. Like, Luffy just tries to run up to the arc a couple of times, and he just gets zapped down. And it's like, yeah, okay, keep keep trying, dude. <laughs> also, that arc is so far away. Not sure what your plan is here. <laughs> Thankfully, Nami does help some, for sure, by adding to the plan to cut down the stock. I was like, yeah, cool, that's awesome. But then I looked at the drawing more, and they were still so far away. So far. I know she said that she hadn't tested max speed on the 
the waiver or whatever, but man, that gold's got to be heavy. <laughs> True. By all the counts, it shouldn't have worked out, but through the magic of manga logic, it does. Yeah, it's fine. I'm, I can suspend my disbelief, no problem. But I feel like this also could have been solved by just drawing the arc a little closer. <laughs> I suppose so. I mean, that would have been a relatively simple task to just eliminate some space there. And people like you wouldn't be whining about it 30 years later. Yeah, and I'll continue to whine forever, I guess. This one's on you, Oda. <laughs> How dare you. Yeah. So after the big jump, Luffy decides that dispersing the Kingdom Come is probably the most important thing right now i don't know how he knew that waving around a giant conductor inside of it would make it go away but i'm glad that it worked out i think luffy's plan was just punch the big cloud a lot and it was just fortunate coincidence that the the manga science (laughs) made it happen the way it did yeah because even nami seemed a little surprised by it like Indeed. So clearly that plan didn't originate from her. Right, she should have said something about it to him. Like, that would have been a nice way to incorporate her a little bit more. Regardless, his golden peony was pretty cool. I liked it. Although it started as, what, like a a firecracker that he then named something else? Indeed. The attack names just flow into the man's head. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's, it's his special power. <laughs> He's just having fun, and he needs he needs to drive that point home. Right. Then, you know, he tries to hit at Anaru, but the man pulls out a giant sumo lightning form. <laughs> We've all got one. Mm-hmm. And then he just uses that to stab him with the spear, which feels a little silly. Uh... I feel like he could have just use the regular spear but like this man is a known lover of theatrics and larger than life stuff so it does fit his character against anybody else that big sumo lightning move would have been quite effective just as it is but uh in this particular instance because it can't directly hurt luffy he had to use it as a bit of trickery to land a spear attack well it's also (laughs) it would be completely unnecessary to actually form it into like a body right i don't think this man ever really needed anything other than just pure lightning to win he probably was just messing around and seeing what he could do right like he got bored and he came up with this move really unnecessary (laughs) (laughs) when you're a god you gotta look the part Uh, until you get smacked in the face well who could have seen that coming So, in the end, I was actually kind of annoyed because literally everyone that was supposed to be dead was fine. Every single person was fine in the end. Uh, yes. That is a very reasonable complaint. Oda sure does like to not kill people. Well, I guess not every single person. Those, like, heavenly warriors... Probably not doing so good. We never saw Yama again. But all of the, like, main named people are shown, like, getting up again. Mm-hmm. And it, it's nice to show the camaraderie there afterwards, but it just makes some of the stakes earlier way lessened. Certainly not Skypea exclusive. It's kind of just the way Oda operates. Uh, we do get some information on the Poneglyphs here. We get uh, we get to see Gull's handiwork, which is a nice little touch. Again, for comments on Luffy having the D initial in his name. Deep in the intrigue. Let's keep it going. Apparently, this this Poneglyph has already been accomplished. Like it has it has served its purpose. So they get to just party and have a good time. <laughs> Yeah, life of uh, the Skypeans slash Shandian is going to be pretty chill from now on. They're going to have a booming economy. Dials are going to be, you know, coming up with new technology every day. It's going to be a golden age. They're somehow going to find the way to get that dial technology down to uh, the Blue Sea, where they'll make a 
a right killing, selling them in the same way as CDs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Someone's about to make a, a quick buck up in Skype here. Yeah, I do hope that we get some current information on them soon. Last we heard was Bellamy and Dressrosa cryptically hinting that he had also gone to Skypea and done a bad. So, Yeah, not a fan of that, not a fan of him, but will be a fan of what probably happens when we find out more. Indeed. But yeah, our crew heads off for their next adventure, and they get, well, I mean, they steal a whole bunch of steel, quote-unquote, <laughs> a whole bunch of gold that the... They, they didn't even know existed. And they run off. I was left wondering how the Octo Balloon gets back to Skypea. Uh, it does not. <laughs> it, it's stuck down there for all of time. That is, that is just the adult stage of the <laughs> Octo Balloon. You must <laughs> jettison yourself out of the cloud, never to be seen again. <laughs> It's a rite of passage. What a life, man. I mean, maybe he'll be blasted back up into the sky by the knock-up stream one day, but odds are that'll kill him. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like... And so the cycle continues anew. <laughs> but like... <laughs> yeah. There we go. I believe they call that the circle of life. Absolutely, yeah. We're scientists. We know things. <laughs> but yeah, the arc is closed. Skype is done. Overall, it is... It's long, right? Like, Skypea has a lot of, a lot of reading, a lot of both backstory for the inhabitants and kind of for the story as a whole. It's turning out twenty years later, but yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but a lot of good fights in it. Some weird ones, but we like <laughs> the weird ones, uh, except for Hattori and Satori. Uh, not the best. But uh, I don't I don't know where it's gonna sit on my rankings by the end of this. I have a feeling it might drop down a few. Was it in your top three when you did your original ranking? I don't remember, man. But me neither. I always speak. Well, I don't know about always, but I usually speak pretty highly of Skype, and I still will. But we'll see once everything else is a little bit fresher. I don't know because I've been looking forward to uh, like Thriller Bark and. And he's lobby a whole bunch, but... And Long Rain Lawn Land. Indeed. <laughs> yes, how can I forget? <laughs> As a whole, sure, Skypea is certainly flawed. No doubt about that. Like you said, it's very long, so I can understand how reading week to week, and at the time, how it seemed so disconnected from the rest of the story, how it could seem like a bit of a slog for some people. But... By the time you get to the end, you get all this stuff with, like, Nolan's flashback. Your opinions on it aside. That sounded rude. I respect your <laughs> opinion about it, of course. But taking what it represents as opposed to the details of what actually occurs there, how it connects to, like, modern-day stuff with Cricket and Wiper specifically, and how their goals are to kind of vindicate their respective ancestors. And then they go on. To do that through Luffy ringing the bell, there's a fair chunk of like catharsis there. If you meant oh for trick sure. it a bazillion chapters ago, or so it feels like. In the end, Luffy finally accomplishes his wipers and Cricket's goal of hitting that bell, ringing it so loud that even Cricket can hear it down on the blue sea. This feels good. And I love the shot of like the silhouette of Luffy right after hitting it. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it is, it is still very good if you pick apart certain parts of it sure it's gonna fall apart but uh that's gonna be true of any arc and any fish i would have pretty much yeah i don't know you can't do that sometimes i do but whatever <laughs> basic summary and i think you will agree with this is that anyone who says skypea is a bad arc is a bad person and that's just the science to it yep <laughs> To wrap up, I suppose, I do have a brief list of the funnier gags, uh, most of which happened at the end because it was all, like, pretty much all action stuff. Yeah. Uh, very serious business up until when Eneru went down. 
one prior to that. Uh, Usopp throwing in some rubber bands of doom into his attempts <laughs> to knock down the beanstalk, which were ultimately fruitless. Uh, hard to believe the rubber bands weren't doing the heavy lifting, but... I don't know. He says that 70% of the damage done was thanks to those babies. Indeed. Uh, Zoro just sucks, I guess, if Usopp's <laughs> math is to be believed. Everybody mourning Pagaya's death, even Pagaya himself prior to them all, yelling yep. at him for pop back up. I guess they would have rather him just stay dead. Me Them too. and everyone else, yeah. <laughs> um, Usopp post arc kind of trading the rubber bands for dials <laughs> and making out like a bandit and doing oh, so yeah. a literal bandit yeah <laughs> indeed uh you alluded to this before but the islanders plan to give them like all the gold <laughs> a great big pillar of it that they definitely wouldn't have been able to fit on the ship anyway no um, <laughs> but the crew mistakes it for a great big weapon and they flee with what they think is stolen <laughs> gold they actually do some pirating for once, and turns out it was just a big misunderstanding. Those silly boys. It's the way it had to be. And then finally, what is perhaps my favorite gag of the series so far, uh, the exit of Skypea that they call Cloud End is literally what it sounds like. The cloud ends, and you fall. <laughs> yeah. And even the Mary's eyes popped out of its head. I can't blame it. I'd be scared myself. Yeah. Guaranteed uh, death until a trusty balloon saves you. I think there was one where right before they're going back to the boat, Zoro was like, ah, why do we have to wait? I'm just going to head back on my own. And everyone just rags on him immediately <laughs> like, no. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Poor Zoro. But hey, at least he's related to Ryuma. So he's got that one feather in his cap for later. Yeah, I'm just waiting for someone to say that Ryuma was terrible with directions, too. Ah, fate. Mm-hmm. But unless you've got anything else to toss in at the end here... No. Sweet. Guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Doesn't seem to be right next week. Shonen Jump app is showing a seven-day release, so the next chapter should come out on September 5th. Feel free to send in your thoughts on the new chapter, the old chapter, whatever you like, via email to inheritedwillpodcasts at gmail, on Twitter to inherited underscore will, or simply in a comment on the YouTube video. That's it from us. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.